people of the internet. Thank you, fans. This is Beans and Rice. The addition being Eater's Digest. So we decided, well, Jose had an idea of changing up what Eater's Digest was. It was always obviously fun um, and a lot of just nonsense, really. But because we pride ourselves on being the number one comedy podcast in Utah, as well as providing some wholesome advice at the end of each episode, we decided we would dedicate Eater's Digest to simply providing some sort of either wholesome advice, uh, information, something to kind of help out the fans, or some current event topic. So this will be less fun, and a bit more serious and informative. Uh, I don't know if Jose want, uh, wants anything to add, but it'll just be me talking today specifically on a topic. Yeah, I think we are good to go. Thank you for everybody listening. Hopefully you like the new debut of uh, Eater Side just here with Hoss teaching us how to. Uh, we're just going to be going over public speaking because apparently that's a, a fairly big fear. I got some information off of psychologytoday.com. So if you want to check out any of uh, that website for any specific information on public speaking, just go to their website in the search bar type public speaking fears, tips. It'll have a, a, a lot of information for you. So glossophobia is the specific scientific term for fear of public speaking. Um, studies suggest that it's slightly more than about 25% of the people. So think of four people. One out of those four people probably has a fear of speaking, um, which makes it seem like a, a fairly common. I To me, it sounds actually less common than I think it is because everyone I've talked to about it usually hates public speaking. Um, but it's just about one in every four people. And for some reason, I think there's a lot of websites out there that claim it's like the biggest fear for people. But based on that statistic alone, it clearly isn't um, the biggest fear. But it's still a big fear nonetheless. So why did I pick this? Is because I think there's a lot of excellent tips you can use. Even if you're not going to regularly publicly speak or ever publicly speak, a lot of these skills or tips will transition into your normal life. So if you're into dating, if you're in at work and you're trying to get a job promotion that you've really been working towards these tips are definitely going to help you with an interview process granted it's not going to tell you how to ace the interview it's going to help you feel more comfortable be more coherent be aware and be present in the actual uh, interview which is a big thing because a lot of people botch interviews even though they might have all of the accreditation and skills necessary to uh, be hired under that position so one of the things I first thought of um, specifically is if you're ever going to tackle an issue within yourself is determine why it's an issue to begin with. So in this case, fear of public speaking, where does this uh, this fear stem from? And this is where I've got some of the points from the psychology today. Uh, so your own appearance actually plays a big issue on or is a big issue as far as what more, mostly people have a concern about with public speaking. How do I look? Um, well, how are they going to perceive me? And a lot of that is really within your control. Think of if you're at a church, if you're at a job site and you're going to do a, some sort of presentation in front of big wigs or high executives, uh, if you're at a funeral doing a eulogy of some sort, all of these situations require probably a higher level of dress, right? You don't want to underdress. It's always best to overdress than to underdress. Imagine walking up to a professional presentation in jean shorts, uh, the shoes you cut your grass in, and a tank top. Like They're, they're probably not going to take you very seriously, if at all. You might get fired. Uh, there are some places that take their dress code very, very seriously. But always overdress. It's better to overdress than it is to underdress. Uh, as well as, it's common. Come on, guys. If, if you look good, you feel good. And if you feel good, you're going to do really good. There's uh, basketball players practice this a lot. They have their whole fashion runway in the NBA when they show up to games. Uh, they take that very seriously for other reasons too, but uh, it's standard across the board. Psychology speaks. If you look good, you tend to feel good. And if you feel good, generally that leads to overall better performance. And in this specific case, again, public speaking, you're going to be far more in the moment and you're not going to be worrying about, oh, is my hair looking okay? Uh, did I Do I look okay? Am I underdressed? Where am I at? So you got to kind of read the audience before you kind of get into it. Uh, another one being judgment on how you speak. So maybe you have a lisp and you have to try to overcome that. Maybe you stutter a lot. Perhaps you're utilizing a lot of crutch words and crutch words aren't like 
and uh but uh things like you're trying to kill time and i sometimes i'm doing it throughout this speech but you have to limit those a little bit it doesn't mean it's never there it doesn't mean that you never use them it just means are they being utilized appropriately so very rarely will you ever have to speak on something i think if you're on, on something you've never really touched right if you're at work and you have to give a presentation it's very unlikely that your boss came to you and you said and said hey host here is a new project that you've never seen before i just gave you all the stats you have to speak on this in front of the entire organization in five minutes do a good job otherwise your job is on the line that's probably not going to happen right if you're doing a job day in day out ideally you should know the job well that should speak to you being a good employee and if you know the job well you should be able to speak to a lot of points on it right Public speaking is nothing more than a conversation, but very heavily one-sided. And I say one-sided because at times you can include the audience and they can participate a little bit, right? But the entire conversation is 100% up to you. Just think of one conversation, but it's strictly 100% on you, which is part of the pressure, which we'll get to in a little bit as well. So if it's work or school or, again, church, whatever, wherever it is you're going to be publicly speaking, at a eulogy... Um, you probably won't be asked to speak on someone you've never met before at a eulogy. Usually it's someone that's close. Uh, it, it sucks, but of course you have knowledge, right? What is that knowledge in that case for a funeral? It's the experiences you had with that person, how that person made you feel, uh, what that person meant to you. You can also speak on behalf of the entire uh, audience there and how they made them feel, right? Maybe that person was always the person who... Uh, checked up on everyone during winter time to make sure they had everything they need and stay warm, uh, delivered cookies on Christmas, whatever the case may be. It's a personal relationship and that's your knowledge or skill set is how has this imp person impacted my life? What do they mean to me? And I'm going to share memories with the audience. Uh, transitioning into that is kind of the lack of skill and knowledge, right? That's another piece of it. If it's work, you should be in into it. If not, you probably have a lot of training that you need to catch up on. If, if it's something you're not very familiar with, again, you probably, even if it's a new subject and you're asked to do something on it, you're slightly uncomfortable, ideally, very rarely, I would imagine that you have almost no time to prep. Let's say you have a couple days, weeks, take 30 minutes a day, brush up on that subject, check up on articles, uh, cite them so that you know when to go back to them and kind of reread them, commit them to memory really find out maybe from experts if you have any sort of resources directly to an expert go to that person ask them for insight say hey i have to speak on giraffes and i have to know what their diet consists of uh can you kind of tell me what their day to in day day in the day in a life of a, a giraffe what do they eat why do they eat these specific things what's poisonous to them start trying to pull out facts that it's not just about what their diet is why can they have this why can't they have that uh, what does this do to their digestive system? What does this do to their overall mood, right? Uh, bananas, I think, is uh, commonly known to kind of help improve mood. So th things like that. It's, it's, I know it's a very bizarre analogy to utilize, but again, that I think that really speaks volumes is, do you take the time to build the skill set or the knowledge about the topic in which you are going to be speaking on? Another issue is pre-existing anxiety, which adds anxiety to your anxiety that already exists. It, it was odd, but it's funny that they put that in there because sometimes I get anxiety, but I never really think about my anxiety adding to my anxiety, right? So you're thinking, I'm going to be anxious, anxious while I speak, and that's now making me anxious before I speak. And there was this quote I read somewhere. I, I can't, this was honestly years ago, but... I'm going to butcher it a little bit. So if you know what it is, feel free to, to correct us and through email. But it says, I don't like, I ignore anxiety because it makes me go through the thing that I hate at least twice. Meaning, okay, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, I'm anxious. You go through it, the actual time. Okay, maybe it's a bit unfortunate, a bit difficult. Um, but your anxiety just added more to it. And you're like, okay, now it's done. I don't have to go through it again. Or I do, but later. So you go through it more than is necessary. Uh, so... Easier said than done for sure, but what are some things that you can do to kind of ease anxiety? Think of things you do normally every day. Maybe there's a specific style of music you like listening to. There's lo-fi beats. Uh, Enya's a really popular one, I think, in workplaces. 
what other music, classical music. And so maybe you need something to kind of subdue and lower your energy. Go into a cubicle, go into a room if it has a closed door. If you're in a position to dim the lights, do so. If not, just close your eyes and kind of get yourself in the moment. Don't think about everyone else. Don't think about what's to come. Think instead about your breathing. Go through those normal tactics that they utilize to kind of lower your blood pressure, lower your heart rate, uh, and don't focus on what's to occur. Focus on your breathing. Um, or let's say you're trying to nail a big presentation at work. I've had those before. A lot of the time, I actually like listening to something hip hop related, right? Uh, hip hop is very ingrained with braggadocio. It's very confident, almost to the level of cockiness. And that really is like music is very, very powerful. So that kind of mood that the hip hop artist can portray on the song translates into you and you kind of start having this exuberance and then like feeling I'm invincible. I can't do any wrong. So maybe it's a verse that really gets you going, or maybe it's the beat, right? Something that hypes you up so you know you can go in with the energy necessary to get the sale or to kill on whatever presentation you're doing. That's really going to put you in the mood. For me specifically, that's the one I use the most is music. Uh, for whatever it is for other people, maybe you go take a 10-minute brisk walk to kind of get the energy, get the bugs out. Find whatever works for you. And the only way you're going to find what works for you is... If you have anxiety, you have to try multiple things. Do you keep a diary or a journal or a log of something that tells you, I felt this way because of this experience, and this helped me really relax. Uh, and try to find more than one, ideally, because sometimes one thing may not be available, right? Because if someone says, taking a shower or taking a relaxing bath, then you're probably not going to be able to do that at work, right? You have a presentation, and yes, you may, it might be four hours away, but unless you have a bath on site, which some offices might, you're not going to be able to hop into the shower and take a hot shower to relax right before your presentation. Plus, there's drying time, getting dressed. That's minutes to kill, more time for you to be a bit more anxious. So uh, try to find something that definitely works for you. The anxiety also might stem from some of the other things that we've spoken on, like appearance, your skill set. Um, you only get better at things when you practice them. It sounds corny, but if you practice in the mirror, uh, you literally speak, you time yourself, Listen to yourself, record yourself. If you don't want anyone watching you, that's a great tactic. You get to hear yourself through a, a recording. Device. All phones will have some sort of recording device. You don't need an old tape recorder. If you have one, utilize it because that's a, a nice vintage piece of technology. But otherwise, you there's almost no excuse. If you're listening to this or watching this, you have a device to help you kind of record and listen. If you have someone you really trust and admire and you feel very comfortable with them, uh, if, they're, if they're willing to put in the time and effort to help you out, sit them down, let them know, this is what I'm going to be speaking on. These are my goals. These are the things I want to watch for. Literally have them critique you. They don't have to kill it. Maybe it doesn't have to be super finessed, but it has to have some sort of polishedness to it, right? Um, so it's just like anything. You can... Listen to all the audiobooks you want to. You can listen to all the podcasts you want to. You can read every book in the world. But until you do something, there's no way you know if you're going to be good at it. There's no way to get good at it until you do it multiple times. Uh, for me specifically with art, again, you might have seen some of the art on this podcast. It, that's not just a, I sit down once and try it and it works, right? This, the little two beans logo that you see um, that we had, the guy with like the curly hair, he looks crazy. The guy with the beanie and the beard. Like there were multiple iterations of that that I had to create before I got to it. So it's interesting because art, a lot of people think, oh, the artist can just do that at the drop of a hat. Some might, but my experience with anyone I talk to in art is funny because uh, there's this idea in their head. They want to get it down on paper or on canvas or sculpt it. And very rarely, if ever, the first time around, it's perfect. And 100% of the time, you're not going to get the exact result you wanted. Um, and that goes into glossophobia, public speaking, fear of public speaking, I should say. You need to practice it to kind of get it under control. It doesn't mean you'll never be fearful of it. Maybe you will. I've never feared it too much. There's always a small level of uh, caring that I want to do. I want to make sure I present myself correctly. I want to make sure that I sound professional if it's in a professional environment or that I know what I'm talking about. I want people to feel engaged in the conversation, whether that be I actually pull their attention in 
and then have them participate verbally, or I take them through a wave of emotion, right? This is the happy part of the conversation. This is maybe the sad part, vulnerable part on my part. Uh, I'll take you through anger, uh, jealous, whatever the case may be, a story. Practice storytelling. That really, really helps. When you're speaking, it obviously requires your lungs because you have to breathe. How many times have you seen, well, I don't know if maybe you've seen it in person. I've actually seen it maybe three times. But someone will faint in the middle of a conversation or in choir or a presentation. A lot of the times that's locked knees, uh, that poor circulation, lack of oxygen, they faint. Sometimes I've seen others where the fear overwhelms them and they kind of forget to breathe, so they start hyperventilating. It's pretty terrible. Take a moment to pause, breathe, and as you pause and breathe, it's going to give you the ability to think about what you're going to say next, right? You don't have to fill every single second with words. There is what they call the power of pause. You say something profound, wait a second, maybe three. Matter of fact, should take, what is that? Pharrell line? I don't know, but it's on Drop It Like It's take 4B. Yeah. <laughs> Before you, and then I'm not going to swear because we don't swear on this podcast ever. Um, but yeah, you can't sustain yourself correctly if you're not breathing. That's posture. Think of, watch someone who plays maybe the trumpet or the tuba in a professional uh, symphony. They have a specific posture they have to have. They take specific breathing breaks where they pause, breathe, and then they continue playing to, to be able to maintain that level of uh, performance. I said it earlier, don't stress the small slip-ups. The more you stress about them during your presentation, the more that's going to stick out. I know people fear, oh, what if I sound terrible? What if I sound like I don't know what I'm talking about? I keep stumbling over my words. And because now you feel like you have to fill in that gap, you keep stumbling over your words because you never give yourself time to recover and you don't forgive yourself for the mess up. Like I say, very, very few people ever don't mess up on speeches. If they don't mess up, I usually uh, think there's two trains of thoughts for me. There is the, I'm reading it off a of paper. Usually those are very boring because there's no emotion attached to them at all. They're just reading. Like if think of your school teacher, some of them read really well, sure, but it's not their original genuine thought or it's not a moment of inspiration that hits them while they're speaking. They're just, here are these words and I'm going to recite them verbatim. That removes a lot of the authenticity and the sincere uh, sincerity that comes with delivering on a topic, right? If you're selling something, whether in a professional business or whatever, I think the audience or whoever your customer is, your the, the market group you're attacking, so to speak, really attaches to your energy. So if everything is rehearsed and polished to the point where you memorized it, I don't think it sounds as good. That's a personal preference of mine. Uh, the other one is, that, so I said that they're reading it, but the other portion is maybe they're not reading it. Maybe they literally just memorized everything. So now it's, oh, they're just going through motions and it kind of comes across. Slipping up a little bit is okay. And people will honestly 100% overlook it as long as the content that you're delivering delivers on whatever it is you've promised or if it's really engaging. Again, I can't think of a speaker who is 100% flawless in their verbal delivery or oral delivery of any speech they've provided. Like you read the, I have a dream speech. He probably memorized and there's a lot of emotion because that was driven by civil rights movement and there's a lot attached to it. Um, but a lot of times as history goes by, which with the Gettysburg Address, I don't, maybe he read it word for word, Abraham Lincoln, RIP, but an RIP to MLK. But I don't know if he said every single word to that extent. Someone took the notes, uh, put them together. So yeah, it sounds like he didn't mess up once. He didn't stutter. He didn't slur his words. He didn't have a pause or he paused in all the right spots. You don't know. We weren't there to hear it. And no one really recorded it with audio. All we know is these were the words he said. And the way you say it is what's the most impactful. So again, slip ups are okay. If you have too many, yes, they will stand out, but that's where all the practice comes into play, where you're actually, you should rehearse it, not to the point of memorization, just to the point of, I am comfortable delivering here. My energy goes up here. This is where I interject my uh, footnote, or I now cite a website that I got this from. 
remember again, I think audience inclusion is, is, is great. And I come mostly from a professional background as far as public speaking. I've done it in churches before when I've given talks. I did it at my sister's wedding. I just said that recently, uh, given a toast for a buddy who's was getting married at the, uh, I don't know what they call it, the rehearsal dinner, I think is what they called it. So I think almost every single time you speak, unless you're a politician who doesn't get to include the crowd, let's say it's the State of the Union, and I even think then they do ask for questions, don't be afraid to include the audience a little bit. Now, there has to be a level of control. They don't get to dictate the entire speech, but ask a question, gain their insight. Like I considered actually asking Jose, hey, what do you think are some of the biggest reasons people fear public speaking? At the beginning, he said he'd agree to chime in, but then as I kept going, I was like, no, nah, it seems like a little bit too back and forth. Let's just keep it with the one speaker. So whatever you're inspired to do in the moment, just do it. Just try it. You'll never know how it goes. If it didn't go so well, back to the drawing board. Next time, I know better. I'll try this instead and move forward with it. Um, humor is highly underutilized. I probably didn't interject a ton of humor. Again, we want to keep it a bit... Um, informational, educational, so I don't want to detract from the information by adding a ton of humor, but throwing in a joke here and there uh, is okay, especially in a professional environment. Too, too many people think it's, oh, it's suits, it's stiff. Regardless, I've presented to a VP before uh, with a bunch, everyone was higher up than me pretty much in the room. I still threw in about five to six jokes in a five-minute presentation, and the reason I think is it lets people's guards down it lets them relate to you a bit more. And again, it keeps them engaged. You don't want to lose the audience. And a lot of people lose the audience when they strictly ramble. They're off topic. Again, maybe they're stuttering. It's, it's so awful that it gets to it. And that's why I'm trying to help you with your fear of public speaking. I've never feared it too much because I, I've never placed too much stake in it. I've always felt comfortable speaking. And at the end of the day, I'm like, okay, maybe I didn't do the best, but I can come back and, and revisit it. So never let the enemy of excellence be perfection. What does that mean? Don't think everything ever has to be so perfect. You know those people. Oh, this, this, and that. Yes, you should be critical of yourself. I think that you should always look at yourself uh, just kind of through a very uh, critical lens, but not to the point where it's so crippling where any small mistake you make, it now becomes the worst thing ever. Uh, if you do that, I don't think you'll find too much success. You'll cause yourself far more stress than is necessary. X or perfection has always been, I think, the uh, enemy of excellence. And that is a quote somewhere, Winston Churchill or Amelia Bedelia, one of the two, I don't know. Uh, but that's kind of just the information I've had so far with public speaking. Do it, uh, dress to the occasion, or excuse me, dress for the occasion, practice in a mirror or record yourself and do something right before the speech that puts you in either a, a state of calm, if you need to be calm, or if you kind of need to get energetic so that you have the energy necessary to deliver on that speech, listen to maybe something that gets you hyped up or whatever it is that gets you energetic, do it. I don't do caffeine. It makes me sweaty. It makes me jittery. It's terrible right before a presentation. But music, that's a whole nother story. It's it's the one that works best for me. But I'm not sure what time are we at right now. Do you know, Jose? We are 24 minutes. Oh, perfect. I thought it was going to be just slightly under 20, but it looks like we're a little bit over. Um. Hopefully you guys have found this helpful, informational. If you guys have topics you want us to review, don't hesitate to email us. If you even have information that you think is going to help us, feel free to include uh, websites, uh, just quote them, whatever the case may be. We're, we'd be happy to kind of cover any subject you'd want to. Again, we're not professionals in every sense uh, of the subjects we're going to speak on. We may not know anything about a subject we speak on in the future, but we'll do some research. Again, we'll provide the best uh, information or cite the information necessary and include it if possible. Again, some of the information I took today was only from one website, psychologytoday.com. The rest is anecdotal evidence that has worked for me, as well as some of the information I've uh, departed on, some of the people I've worked with to kind of help with it. Uh, but this is your boy, the Putter Pecan Puerto Rican host. And then host Beefy's over there. Uh, Thank you guys for tuning in. We appreciate it. Eaters Digest. Go eat something fruitful and wholesome. <laughs>